I recently had the opportunity to meet Sayasat Nurbek, who I would consider one of Kazakhstan's thought leaders and most forward thinkers. He has degrees in international law, geopolitics, and he speaks eight languages. Sayasat has worked in the U.S. government as Congressman Mark Smith's assistant, and he has held numerous positions within the Kazakh public and private sector. He is the director of the Kazakh government's first think tank, the Public Policy Institute, and is one of the managing directors of the Astana International Financial Center. In this interview, we discuss the geopolitics of Kazakhstan and what its future looks like as it integrates into the global economy with a new stock exchange, cryptocurrency, and China's Belt and Road Initiative. I hope you enjoy the talk, and please do share the interview on social media. Subscribe to the Geopolitics and Empire podcast. We have a free uh, weekly newsletter, and uh, also subscri subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, think about donating $1 a month on Patreon to help support the work we do. We are here today with Sayasat Nurbek, who is the Managing Director of the Astana International Financial Center. Uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to discuss the geopolitics of mm -hmm. Kazakhstan, okay. the economics and its development. And my first question for you is, how would you describe the geopolitical position of, of Kazakhstan? And by this, I mean its current relationship with its neighboring countries, as well as the big powers such as USA, Russia, and China. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, let me start by uh, an interesting example I had in Canada. So we, I was attending a conference in Canada a few years ago, 10 years ago. So I said, how are you doing in Canada? They said, well, it's like slipping in a bed with an elephant, meaning the U.S. You always have to keep one eye open. Mm -hmm. So in our case, but they said, but then the, the colleagues of mine, they said, look, but, you know, we're, we're, we're okay. I mean, we would survive. But we're really worried about you guys. Do you ever slip with two elephants in your bed? <laughs> so meaning, the, you know, the, the China and Russia. And, you know, in the 90s, when Kazakhstan first gained its independence, there were a lot of... Uh, really negative, very, really negative, negative scenarios. Uh, and a lot of experts in geopolitics, a lot of uh, politicians, uh, public policy advisors, they agreed that Kazakhstan was a powder keg. It was a coin, you know, they coined the term a powder keg. Why? Because all the, 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 the arguments, all the, the, the background information, the situation, geography, and there's this great book, Curse of Geography, right, was against us. I mean, you have a multinational country with uh, 130 ethnic groups living on the same roof, with lots of religions, in a very bad, very unstable neighborhood, with, of, with this, you know, Soviet Union inertia, with a lot of ecological problems, with the fourth largest nuclear arsenal in the world. So a lot of people are wondering, nah, nah, they're not going to survive. I mean, they're gonna, the country would be split with such huge territory and with such small population. Just country inevitably will fall in pieces, will fall apart. But, you know, you know history proved it wrong. A lot of these assessments, it proved it wrong. We did, not only we were able to, to keep our independence and keep our territory and unity, we also, you know, showed some significant... Uh, economic uh, development, political development. But, of course, the neighborhood, I mean, the curse of geography, it, it does play its role. So, like, five, seven years ago, the political situation, geopolitical situation in the region was quite stable, right? So we had a tripod situation, Russia, China, and, and the United States. The United States primarily had a huge interest in energy sector, in minerals, uh, uh, and of course, it, it had U.S. had interest in Kazakhstan as the biggest country in the region in keeping it stable, because the, the Kazakhstan stability uh, means the regional stability. I mean, you have five countries in the region, and Kazakhstan is the largest, not by population, but by economic prosperity in terms of political heft, in terms of logistics, in terms of infrastructure. It is you know, this binding country for the whole region. So, in, you know, in terms of uh, energy resources, uh, pipelines, uranium production, mineral production, U.S. was quite interested in keeping this country stable. Russia was very interested in keeping the whole region stable. You know, um, Russian political scientists, geopolitic geopolitical experts, they always 
they have this saying that Kazakhstan is the soft underbelly of Russia. Why? You look at Russians' map, map of Russia, um, the Ural Mountains, they divide Russia into two, there's the European part and the Siberian part, the eastern part. The European part is most developed, it's most populated, and it, it, most of the infrastructure, most of the manufacturing, the factories, plants, manufacturing sites are located on, in, in western part, in the European part. But all the raw materials, the, the, the energy sources, um, food, uh, raw materials, minerals, ores, wood, uh, oil and gas, they all come from eastern part, from Siberian part, which is not populated, which has a very scarce population. And Kazakhstan is kind of dives in and it kind of, you know, divides Russia into two. And it, 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 the thinnest part, like, like say, if you, if you look at Russia, it's a very long country. The, the thinnest part is where Kazakhstan plunges into Russian territory. And his, historically, Central Asia was always seen as threat to Russia's unity. Uh, you remember the great game when oh. British Empire and Russian mm -hmm. Empire, it is beautifully described in Rudyard Kipling's novel Kim, about this young boy, Kim Bilohara, who was hired by British intelligence services, and there was a great game. And back then, in 18th, 19th century, when we, when we talk about Central Asia, it was a much wider concept. It would start from uh, Western Siberia, the Central Asia, as we know, the five countries, the Kistans, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, partially Iran, and it will go all the way to northern India. That was the original Central Asia. Mm -hmm. And Frederick Starr, John Hopkins, very own Frederick Starr, he has this, a lot of a series of beautiful articles describing the cultural, educational, and trade space that used to be called Central Asia, rediscovering the Central Asia, which is one of his, um, one of my favorite articles. So now, Kazakhstan, Russia was always interested in keeping the region stable because then it would mean, it would be, it would influence Russian unity. And in case of disability here, it would threaten this flow of supplies mm -hmm. between the eastern and western part. China, again, was interested in keeping this region stable. Why? It is crucial for their One Belt, One Road initiative. Now it's called BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, officially. Uh, so there were a lot of, uh, when we talk about one belt, one road, it's not just one road, it's actually a series of maritime and land routes, mm -hmm. several of them. But one of the key direction is passing through Central Asia. And through Central Asia, especially through Kazakhstan, not only China is envisaging to, 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 to provide this continuous supply uh, of trade uh, with European market, but also it can diversify through Kazakhstan, through Central Asia, you could go not only through Russia and Belarus to, 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 to Western Europe, you could go through Caspian Sea and Azerbaijan and Turkey to Black Sea and Mediterranean to do well-established uh, logistical uh, infrastructures. Or you can go down south through Iran, through Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, and you have access to Bandar Abbas and Karachi ports. And you have access to Persian Gulf with well-established a logistical infrastructure as well. So it, Central Asia is like this, it's becoming this very important hub, very important region again. It, it is key to many, many, many other regions. It's kind of a, it, it's, it's a, you know how they call it, but my favorite one is as well. Chinese call Central Asia and Kazakhstan now buckle in the belt. You know, like, like one belt, one road, but mm -hmm. buckle in the belt, the one that binding together is the Central Asian region. So we had a tripod situation, which was quite stable. So we had three major powers, mm -hmm with their own interests in the region, and none of them was interested in destabilizing the region. So that also helped uh, 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 helped Kazakhstan and Central Asian countries to keep the stability. If you look at the regions, you can compare it to Middle East, compare it to Northern Africa, you'd see in this 25 years, mm -hmm. The, the, we had all kinds of revolutions and conflicts Arab and the country, Arab Spring, the countries falling apart, their presidents being killed like in Libya. Mm -hmm. But this region, despite all odds, despite all the arguments we had, was able to be stable, was to keep mm -hmm. stability because the balance of powers was there. And that was quite, you know, it was one of the key uh, factors that, you know, helped to keep that stability. On, on the, yeah, but so nowadays we do see some signs of destabilization. Why? Because USA has pulled out of the region. Mm -hmm. We don't have a tripod anymore. We have two legs left, that is Russia and China. 
And in China, a vacuum which was created after withdrawal of the United States is quickly filled with Chinese presence, with Chinese soft power, with Chinese influence. Why? Because with 37 trillions of GDP, 1.7 trillions of Russian GDP, we're not talking about partnership here. We're not talking about equilibrium here. Mm -hmm. We're talking about one power, global power, which is increasingly becoming more important, more influential, with lots of resources trying to, you know, push its own interests in the region. That might lead, well, the balance of power is not there anymore. There's a new balance of power, which is not very balanced. That would be the, my conclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And on that point, I was going to mention, we see an example, uh, Kazakhstan will be switching from Cyrillic to the Latin alphabet. Yeah which does signal a kind of change to a greater national, independent, and sovereign identity. And Astana has been hosting a series of these Syrian peace talks. And I was going to use the analogy, this, is it Kazakhstan can be considered a Switzerland of, of Central Asia? Is it um, nor, more neutral? You said Washington has pulled out. And so is Ooh. Kazakhstan looking to work with um, all countries and be its own? Form its own identity? Yep. Well, one great thing about our political leadership, and namely our president, uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, from the very first years of independence, he was always trying to pursue what we call a multi vectoral foreign policy. I mean, working with all the global powers, working equally with all the regional powers, trying to keep the balance. Balance was the key um, trademark of, uh, of Kazakhstan's foreign policy trying to promote ourselves as, as this peacekeeping. Well, Switzerland is a good uh, example, but we're not Switzerland. I mean, Turkmenistan, we try to become this Switzerland. It's like, like guys, we don't want to deal with anybody. We, we just want to be the safe haven thing. So uh, in a way, we, we are trying to promote ourselves as safe haven. Not only economical, but also political. I mean, through these 20 plus years of stability, of uh, continuity, we try to promote us that we are safe, we are politically safe, safe haven, but we are active safe haven. So we were trying to seek a more active role in, in regional peacekeeping mm -hmm. measures in, in, in a larger area as well, through Shanghai Cooperation Organization, for example, through uh, OE participation in OEC, Organization for Security, uh, right, in, in Europe, and, and through United Nations, of course. So we do have like this kind of a more than regional political ambitions uh, and, and uh, non nuclear non proliferation and you know we had the fourth largest nuclear arsenal in the world. I mean it, it was quite big argument. Muammar Gaddafi, interesting fact for you, Muammar Gaddafi in nineties, you know the the Libyan president and ruler, he wrote a letter. It is a fact through diplomatic channels, official diplomatic channels, to, to, to Vanny, this is his first years of independence. He writes a letter to our president and says, can you please keep your nuclear weapons? And I'm ready, officially, provide billions of dollars in financial aid to make sure this nuclear arsenal is kept, is, you know, uh, maintained. Uh, uh, we will provide all the, the financial support to keep it. And... Let's make the very first uh, Muslim A bomb. Mm -hmm. You know, well, let's have a joint project to develop the very first Muslim A bomb. So it was, they, they were like direct offers. Keep it, guys. I mean, it's it's a big, big stick you have, and not many Muslim countries or countries in the region, of course, Soviet countries have that kind of stick. Keep it. We were the only one with that kind of arsenal, the fourth largest in the world. But. Uh, I think it was a very wise decision that, now, look, when you, you look at the countries who do not have scientific research potential, who do not have stable democratic institutions or any, uh, you know, power institutions and do have nuclear weaponry, it's a disaster in many cases. A disaster or you become an outcast, a global outcast, you become, um, or you just, you, you bring the country in turmoil. Uh, instead, we were able to create a security network. Instead, we were able to create, to trade in um, our, our nuclear arsenal for security uh, guarantees for creating this kind of a promoting our image of a very stable, very peaceful country. And it is, it's quite very, it was very highly appreciated on the United Nations level, for example. You know, this next year, 
Kazakhstan officially becomes chairman of Security Council of the United Nations. So in January, I think second half of January, our president is traveling to New York to officially speak at United Nations uh, building to accept, in order to accept the chairmanship of the Security Council. That was a, a partially thanks to that nuclear non-proliferation policy. So uh, we are... Uh, the, the only problem we have right now is the influence. We live in a really bad neighborhood, a really bad neighborhood. I'll tell you a joke. It's like a legend saying, old saying. Do you know why chipmunk has three stripes on his back? Chipmunks, you know, they have right. three stripes on their back. So a chipmunk was a good friend with bear once. So one day, bear wakes up in a very good mood. And he comes to his dear friend Chipmunk and says, Oh, my dear friend, let me pat you on your back. You're such a good friend. And you know, the bear's claws are not retractable. Mm -hmm. So, de -de -de -de. the maxim, the, the, the logic behind the philosophy behind that maxim says, if you're a friend with bear, even if he's in a good mood, mm -hmm. you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. So, no direct allegations or <laughs> are made in this maxim. It's just an old, an old uh, legend of some sort. But we have to be really careful. Uh, you know, we live in a very difficult, very interesting neighborhood. So we have to be really, really careful. Um, and last, last thing to mention, so far, so good. If you assess the overall situation, we're doing great. We're doing just enough to survive, so to speak and not to have troubles with any neighboring countries. That worths a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, they say the most expensive thing in this life is independence. Mm -hmm. You always have to pay high price for being independent, impartial, neutral. So I think we, 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 we are able to, to navigate our way, our policy and foreign policy and regional policy in a way that we're not uh, making any foes. We're friends with everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah? And maybe if we could also mention a bit the economic uh, aspect. I'm here in Kazakhstan working with the 2020 Development Strategy in Education. You have the 2050 uh, Modernization mm -hmm. 3.0 um, Development Program. And I, I also understand there's a new stock exchange that's, I think, going to be mm -hmm. um, created soon in Kazakhstan. As well, I found this interesting that President Naz Nazarbayev has been recommending the creation of a Kazakh cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us a little bit about this development, uh, the economic developments, yeah. the cryptocurrency, the stock exchange, and where you see economically Kazakhstan in mm -hmm. the future? So what, what happens economically? We've been doing, we were one of the first fastest growing economies in the region. We had the highest GDP, still have the highest GDP and GDP per capita in the region. But inevitably we fall into what is called by economists the middle income trap. You might have heard the expression, the term. So it is really easy to, for many countries to develop quickly thanks to um, traditional macroeconomic mm -hmm. instruments, I don't know, the public policy, the capital allocation, big public tenders. Oh, well, of course, the oil prices helped us a lot. You know, that's, yeah. you, know yeah. you can't mention that. I mean, we are an oil exporting country so we did really when the prices soared we were really doing really good all these money were flowing into economy now we inevitably came to a point that we we found ourselves in this middle income trap and many countries try to uh, so there are many countries who have showed some quick results to a certain level then they come into this middle income trap it's like a glass ceiling you can't break through uh, and not met many countries. The, the true success stories comes with the countries who are able to bypass, to to uh, to 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 do, you know, to pass this threshold of middle income, to to get themselves rid of this trap. And that's true success stories about modernization of your economy, diversification of your economy, building smart economy, building knowledge-based economy, providing some intellectual products, building strong solid research infrastructure, solid education infrastructure, solid manufacturing, engineering, uh, human capital. That's where we're stuck. 
And the, all these programs, modernization 3.0, industrialization 4.0, Kazakhstan 2050 strategy, are all built around um, the stumbling blocks, improving education. Look at where we sit. I mean, it's a beautiful building. We have a lot of uh, um, investments in education and research, building, you know, improving the human capital, improving the capacity. But, but here's the, here's the problem. I mean, we, we, here we, we're a bit stuck. Oil curse, it did happen to Kazakhstan. I haven't seen any country which actually get rid of oil curse. I mean, it did happen. Resource curse, we did. The Dutch disease, we did inevitably fall into the trap of Dutch disease. So the, the biggest challenge for Kazakhstan right now is how do we, or how do we rebuild ourselves? How do we bypass? How do we jump over this trap, middle income trap? Um, Human capital is, is is partially an answer to that. We are building, you know, we're building school, new schools. We have Nazarbayev University in Astana. We're trying to 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 upbring new kind of generation of researchers and policymakers and so on and so forth. But um, my personal opinion, we're a bit late. You know, we should have started this a bit earlier. So we were like enjoying this prolific years of high income, oil income. We lost, I think, five to ten years. But the, the idea is, the understanding of the problem is there. So I think if, you know, they say 50% of success uh, of, you know, overcoming a challenge is accepting challenge, but you have a problem, mm -hmm. right? So I think that we're clearly understanding that we have problems. We need to, to, to tackle these problems. Um, the strategies, well, you know, you can write the best strategy ever. You can hire the best strategies ever. You can write a very beautiful piece of paper. It's all about implementation again. It's, about, it's all about efficiency. So what happens now, there are f three, f several challenges that are really, you know, impeding this process. One, an efficiency of our bureaucracy, of our bureaucratical machine. You know, but bureaucracies all over the world are right. now facing huge challenges. The the uh, Alvin Toffler, the famous American uh, scientist, the, the political scientist and the, the sociologist, he, he coined this term, the burden of power. The power over everywhere in the world, it has a burden. Mm -hmm. it, is, it has to fight its own inefficiency. It has to fight a lot of challenges, the information overflow. Uh, the inefficiency. Um, another uh, great American political scientist, Amitai Etzioni, he, you know, he's born in Germany, he teaches in, in Israel. He coined this new term, responsiveness. How quick can a political system respond to a different mm -hmm. uh, feedbacks, different inquiries from different parts of society? How it can digest and give Back, give the feedback back. How can it quick responsiveness? We lack that responsiveness, unfortunately. And one of the last thing I think it, it comes, in, you know, you might have heard about the the Daron Ajemolus and James Robinson's Why Nations Fail. It's a new of book, course, yeah. new yeah, kind of a theory fail. on institutions. Mm -hmm. Why nations fail because of the different types of institutions that define the political and economic reality in those countries. And we talk about the inclusive and extractive institutions uh, and institutions uh, that rules of the game, basically, that provide free access, that give more rights, that include, involve mm -hmm. more people, uh, that provide, uh, you know, freedom of speech, that provide freedom to act, that provide, that, that force or push for entrepreneurship for you know risk taking uh, innovation these type of economies usually are more sustainable more flexible and more competitive so i think the biggest challenge in in, uh, in in terms of kazakhstan lies in redesigning our public institutions you could i mean as a foreigner you could see that it's you know value system institutions in this country are still there's a path dependence from soviet union you know people are still they're quite afraid to speak up their mind. And there's a direct correlation between the institutions and value systems that reflect on economic growth, that reflect on entrepreneurial activity, that reflect on innovation, innovative uh, initiative. 
I, I'm conducting a research, and that might be a you know topic for different uh, blog for different interview. From uh, about four or five years ago, I started a research, um, uh, and I'm using the methodology of World Value Survey, run by Professor Ronald Engelhardt from Michigan University. Uh, and we're using their methodology to define how value systems, how value structures are changing, reshaping in Kazakh society, in modern Kazakh society. That might be a very interesting, you know, piece of work for you, because what we've been, what we've seen is that uh, the, the, the resistance, resistance of these old value systems, it actually curbs, it actually limits. Uh, the potential uh, of many, many parts of society, mm -hmm. you know, like start businesses, innovate, take risks, um, you know, and, and it directly reflects in political institutions and freedom of speech, uh, elections. Mm -hmm. You know, we have very high number of people showing up on elections, for example, you know, because, you know, oh, it's uh, nothing depends on me, mm -hmm. it is not my responsibility. I don't like to take any risk. Why should I show up and vote? You know, everything is pretty fine. So there are this, this kind of mentality things that actually, and I think the biggest challenge that we have right now is changing that mentality, is changing those values, trying to get rid of some uh, uh, value systems and public institutions that curb, uh, you know, initiative. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest challenge that we have right now. And we're out of time, but just really quickly, could you answer this um, question? Uh, what are some things that uh, Kazakhs can do practically to help transform their country? Uh, you're, you're, this is what you were saying, but you yeah, know, what's one final thing you one would tell One final people? thing. Now, let me just finish my thought because you mentioned cryptocurrencies. Uh -huh. You mentioned the financial hub. Um, we, you know, things are moving so quickly now that countries that, uh, who, who, you know, who were not leapfrogging, if there's a term, an economic term, leapfrog, when, let's say, you're two steps back mm -hmm. and, you know, in their economic development or some industry thing, you know, developed countries, they're just way ahead. And you say three, five steps back. So instead of taking every single step and stage these developed countries have passed, instead it's much easier to leapfrog, to bypass some stages and take direct hit at this new stage of technologies. China did this. Mm -hmm. And leapfrogging has a lot of advantages. Sometimes, you know, it's the biggest, the quickest example comes from construction. To demolish an old building and build a new one, a completely different architecture and design building, mm -hmm. it takes you much more resources than building this very building from scratch. Mm -hmm. Because demolishing takes a lot of resources. You have to take out, clear the garbage, take out the foundation, you have to dig in, you know, just to, to demolish the foundation. If you have no foundation, no old buildings, it's much easier to build something from scratch. You save a lot of energy and resources. Mm -hmm. And China did this. Instead of trying to, uh, you know, build an old, kind of a, to, to, to create a vast, old traditional industry, they leapfrogged, they jumped directly to IT. Look at the companies they're developing now. Their biggest company, Alibaba, mm -hmm. yeah, Tencent, the WeChat. Mobile finance, online, you know, the, the financial technologies, right? The artificial intelligence. So they and, and they should they should be actually now building much more plants mm -hmm. and factories, all traditional factories. They said, no, 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 we're not going to disperse our resources on something which is already outdated. We'll f aim for future. Mm -hmm. We will save our energy and resources and time. We'll try to focus on what's next. Mm -hmm. Remember the famous expression, Wayne Gretzky? Do you play hockey? Yeah. So he said, he, it is his most famous expression. I'm a good player. I'm a good hockey player. Not because I follow the puck. I try to be there where the puck will arrive. Right? Mm -hmm. so I'll try yes. to be there where the puck comes, right? So 
I'm not following. I'm, I'm, I'm predicting the trajectory, mm -hmm. right? So that's the, the I think the, the, in a way the cryptocurrencies. These are big new things. Mm -hmm. Some experts say the cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology will change, will reshape, redefine the financial industry. In ten years' time, they say the whole the financial industry as we know it. Five, ten years will change completely. Banks will change the role. Financial institutions will change. There will be companies issuing their own currencies. Some experts say, on the other hand, ah, miracle is not happening. Revolution is not happening. There's so much was invested in existing financial infrastructure. It's not that easy to make that change. So anyway, we, we're trying to be, like as Wayne Gretzky said, we're trying to be where the puck will go. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that was all the initiatives, and Astana Financial Financial Center is saying this type of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, there are about 800 financial centers in the world right now, if you believe Global Financial Centers Index. And there are a lot of these countries who are trying to have their own financial hubs. Mexico City, Istanbul, Bombay, Mumbai, sorry, Mumbai, uh, Bangkok, uh, Moscow, now Astana, yeah. So apart from these well-established financial centers like London, Hong Kong, New York, Singapore, Shanghai, now all of the countries trying to to have their own financial centers. Why? Because they're trying to keep the money in the country. Mm -hmm. Because what happened is a lot of these developing countries, a lot of capital, there's a huge capital outflow, and money tends to go to financial centers, hubs, where they believe they have more diversified, more high-quality financial services. So the China, for example, they had Hong Kong. We're now investing a lot in building Shanghai Financial Center. Why? Because we don't want the money go out of the country. We want them to stay here by providing same conditions, same terms, by introducing British law, mm -hmm. by providing security, by providing safe haven type of uh, you know uh, territories in order to keep the money in the country. So we're having. And we can serve, attract the money from the region because in the region, you look at the in the region, it's huge Eurasian region. Mm -hmm. There are no financial centers. The closest ones are Dubai, Moscow is shut down, has been shut down. Istanbul, Hong Kong. On the hand, we're talking about five hundred kilometer empty space. So in this case, so geography geography does play a role. And the final question, I think, when we talk, you know, everybody now talks about this modernization. Uh, and there's this new program, you can't actually properly translate it into English. Spiritual renovation, mm -hmm. they call it sometimes. Ruhani Jangri, you might have heard about it. They have these lectures and everything. Uh, and in, in a nutshell, it talks about changing your mentality. It talks about challenge. It talks about changing the way we do things. Changing the way we look at things. And it starts with every single citizen. Because still, we have this very strange kind of post-Soviet mentality. We always look up to someone. We say, okay, when will they give us the directive? What should I do? What should I speak? Where should I go? I mean, you've seen that mentality. I mean, as a foreigner here, yeah. you, talk to, you talk to people, and they say, you know, you know what? Let me go and talk to the director, I, I, principal. I, he would know better. I, I get in trouble. I just start doing doing things, things that uh, you can't do that, you know, because you know we have to talk yeah. to someone. We have to get approval. We have to comply. We have to get advice. Mm -hmm. We need to get this approved by someone. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not a bad thing. I mean, in a way, it, it's kind of a mentality thing. But that's the the the, 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 the biggest thing that actually curbs initiative. It actually curbs uh, taking risk. It actually curbs innovation in a way. So we, 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 we're, like, we're creating a very, it's a very strange situation. On one hand, we want people to innovate. We want people to, you know, make new things. We want people to have startups. We want our children, the peoples in this school, go ahead, make new things, take initiative. On the other hand, we are curbing this very initiative by making things by by one thing, and I've I've found an answer to that. Mm -hmm. It's the culture of mistake. Mm -hmm. We have a very different culture of mistake. Making mistakes is bad in our culture. Mm -hmm. It's so bad it can be lethal for you. You you cannot make mistakes. You have to play the role. 
all the social roles we have in our society are close to ideal. Yeah, you look at all these kids and people and principals. They're like, wow, ideal people. Yes, and have no, nobody wants to make any mistakes. So you sit in a kid. meeting and there's a principal talking. Mm -hmm. Nobody can raise his voice and say, you know, shut the fuck up here. I have my own opinion on this. Mm -hmm. No, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the price you might pay for that mistake mm -hmm. might be lethal for you. And we are tr I mean, from the very from from kindergartens, we are brought up with that single idea: mm -hmm. making mistakes is bad. So the proper culture of mistake, and look at you've lived in U.S. Uh, Mexico, by the way, is got kind of the same mentality. No, 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 no mistakes. A little bit. Yeah. Adios, el más dando. No, 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 just you know, no, 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 no mistakes. <laughs> si, señor, si, señor. <laughs> uh, you know, in you in in America, for example, it's a very different culture of mistake. Make mistakes. Making mistakes is good for you. Mm -hmm. You get experience. In order, in order not to make mistakes, you have to have experience. In order to have experience, you have to make mistakes. You have to learn from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how it's reflected in legislation, for example, bankruptcy. In American legal system, bankruptcy of physical persons is allowed. You started a business, didn't go well, go bankrupt. Not a problem. Mm -hmm. You started another business, didn't go well, go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. In our countries, Going bankrupt, it's a very bad thing. Mm -hmm. Jeez, you have this, you know, black labeled on you. Mm -hmm. It's a very painful process on the other hand, and then you just, it just stays with you forever. An American system, wow, this guy has a bankruptcy history. Let's, you know, employ him. Mm -hmm. Why? He has experience. He's a trained guy. And if, if you see how it reflects in mentality and culture and pop culture and movies, you take any Hollywood movie, you take any American movie, it's all about mistake. Have you mm -hmm. seen it? You, it's like, catch me if you can. The pursuit of happiness, Will Smith. Mm -hmm. You make a mistake, the, the protagonist of the movie makes some mistakes, has a very painful experience, learns his lessons, yeah? And then there's this critical mm -hmm. scene in the movie, and he makes the right decision. Why? Because he had painful experience, and he learned from it, and he made a mistake. It's like our, the president as well, the pre uh, President Trump. He's had that same oh, all over again. Mistakes, so. All over again. I and, and drowned. I stumbled. Mm -hmm. I've fallen, but I was always able to rise and get back what's mine. Mm -hmm. And get back what's mine. So that's kind of typical American success story. Mm -hmm. Rise and fall. Rise and fall. Learn from your mistake. You take any speech by any of these big startup leaders, or Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. whatever. Connecting the dots. They always talk about failures. You know, they have this fuck up nights mm -hmm. thing. Like, I made, a, I made a mistake. I acknowledged it. I learned from it. And that helped me to excel. That helped me to perfect the product. That helped me to be successful. So I think one of the things, one, we have to start from each citizen has to start looking back to his own story. And, and acknowledging... We cannot go on like this anymore. Acknowledging, have you watched, have you seen that uh, series, Newsroom? I haven't Very seen it. Very famous one. Netflix, yeah. Why America is not the greatest country in the world. Uh, you have course, seen that. Uh, Daniels, Jeff Daniels. Yeah, Jeff Daniels. Yeah. Why America is not the greatest, I want a human moment from you. Because, well, America is not the greatest country in the world anymore. Why? We are number one. Da, 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 and he goes on and right, says, right, right. look, he says, let's accept that. We're not the greatest country in the world anymore. And then we Accepting, on. acknowledging is first step in uh, rebuilding yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think, first thing, we have to accept we can't go on like this. Oil curse, it did happen. Judge disease, it did happen. Uh, we are not that efficient. We have to acknowledge that we're not that efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some crappy bureaucratical system. Yeah, we have to acknowledge that, and we have to rebuild ourselves. And one thing we have to uh, fix is the culture of mistake. Mm -hmm. We have to fix and acknowledge it is okay to make mistakes. It is okay to learn from them. No, no, no. It, it is not okay making mistakes and not learning from them and being punished, punished to such a level mm -hmm. that you don't want to make any mistakes right. in, anymore. It's about, you know, carefully bringing up the experiences, combining those experiences, and building a better country and better future for all of us. God bless you. No. <laughs> Sorry. All right. All right, well, yeah, we'll have to end that, that sounded like a presidential speech, ain't it? Yeah, yeah. presidential debate. Yeah. God bless God Kazakhstan. God bless America, Kazakhstan, you know. And, and, and all the citizens of Kazakhstan, 
Mm -hmm. uh, with your help and support, we'll rebuild this country, and it'll be the greatest country in the world. Let's make this country great again. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've been here three months, and I'm enjoying my time in Kazakhstan. I invite other people to come and visit. Yep. And I do wish uh, peace and prosperity for Kazakhstan. And thank you. Thank you for the interview. Thank you.